All right. So again, thanks very much for taking the time to, uh, to listen to us. So it's early in the morning here, but uh, I know it's different times uh, around where all our participants are, so appreciate the time and effort. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of an introduction uh, about AEP and then uh, talk to you a, a little bit more detail about uh, this new transmission line technology we've developed and some of the uh, rationale behind it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more information that we can share about technology. So if there are interests, there is interest in follow-up, uh, please just uh, feel free to contact us. So a little bit about AEP. Uh, we're a, a large uh, utility operating in uh, 11 states uh, and in the United States uh, from West Texas all the way uh, into Virginia. Uh, we have uh, approximately 40,000 miles of uh, electric transmission. We are the largest transmission owner in the U.S. We have uh, 32 gigawatts of generation capacity. Uh, much of that was uh, fossil-based generation, but we're in the process of transitioning a significant portion of, of that over to, um, to more renewable and, and uh, natural gas-based generation. Uh, as, as many in the U.S. Are, are transitioning as well. And we also have a large uh, distribution system serving our 5.4 million customers over those 11 states. So we, we serve a very geographically diverse uh, service territory, which, which can present some unique challenges that uh, give us a lot of experience that led to the, the development of this technology. So a little bit about the impetus, and this is not a, a something unique to us uh, at AEP or, or in the U.S., um, but based on the timing of when our electricity grid was developed, uh, we're reaching a, a stage where um, many of those facilities are reaching uh, upwards of 50 years of age and in some cases approaching or exceeding 100 years of age. And at the same time, we are transitioning from, you know, conventional, uh, primarily coal-based generation to more natural gas-based generation, more renewable power, uh, which requires us to um, shift and adapt, um, you know, fixed assets in the transmission grid to generation and power flow patterns that are uh, relatively new to our system. And that, that change is happening uh, rapidly compared with the 100-year uh, development of our electric system. So this is both a challenge and an opportunity. It is an opportunity as we go back and rethink the grid and how it works. It's an opportunity to, um, to build uh, an art and what we believe to be transmission and distribution infrastructure that can be significantly more efficient um, than what we've uh, built in the past. Um, we know that uh, rights of way for electric transmission lines, uh, it, it can be difficult to, to find and difficult to route. Um, but we have uh, 200,000 miles of high voltage transmission in the U.S. already. So how can we best reuse or repurpose that existing right of way in a way that we can increase the capacity and increase the efficiency of those corridors without impacting uh, the public and the communities as much. At the same time, we're very uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, we are operating a very complex system and changes to the generation fleet in particular moving towards more renewable-based generation does have an impact on reliability, does have an impact on um, voltage management and power system operations, and also understanding that we're just now inching into integrating uh, a lot of new technologies, both on the transition distribution side, that we need to be able to design a system that is extremely flexible and has the ability to uh, adapt to what technologies that we are just now evolving or potentially haven't thought of at this point. So in the U.S., the, the regulatory environment is shifting towards uh, policies that support uh, building new and, and upgraded infrastructure and encouraging us to build as efficiently as possible. Uh, just recently, uh, a regulatory uh, body uh, known as the uh, NARUC, which is the uh, acronym at the bottom, 
it's the National Association of Regulatory Utility uh, Commissions, uh, passed a resolution that supports and promotes uh, cost-effective transmission technologies to do exactly what we're what these goals are. So uh, it is, is something we're, we're we're changing at a fairly rapid pace, uh, but we believe it's very encouraging in terms of grid modernization. So the, what I want to talk to you today about is something we come up with, have come up with at AP, known as the breakthrough overhead line design, or bold. Um, and then this is just one example that we have of a uh, technology designed to, to better utilize uh, our utility corridors, increase capacity, and increase efficiency. Uh, we just recently have completed the development of this technology. Um, we're currently building the first project using this technology in Indiana. Uh, it'll be placed into service here in just a couple months. Um, and we've established a subsidiary of AEP transmission, and the purpose of that subsidiary is to work with utilities, um, both in the U.S. and internationally, um, to work to build uh, bold transmission lines. So, you know, the, the design itself is, is unique and different um, compared to our, what we've conventionally been building <clears throat> over the past hundred years. Um, and it requires a certain amount of uh, technical um, expertise uh, and support in order to implement. And so the purpose of this entity is to help utilities then adopt this technology as a new line standard for use uh, where it makes sense on their system. It is different in, in several ways, both from a, a planning perspective uh, and from, you know, what you'll see and obviously is from a structural perspective. Um, it is not necessarily significantly different than uh, conventional lines in terms of the, the hardware and equipment. Um, it is not a gadget, per se. It is uh, a rethinking uh, the physics of how transmission lines work, and the, the design is really there to leverage um, some of those changes. Um, so it's a, it's a nice uh, blend of it is a technological advance, but it's also something that can be easily integrated into an existing system uh, without too much of a, a hassle. A little bit of the history behind it, um, our, the impetus for us developing a new transmission line was actually some challenges that we experienced in, in the state of Texas, where we were developing significant amounts of wind power in the western part of the state and required uh, long, uh, high-capacity transmission lines to deliver that power to the eastern part of the state where the major major cities and major metropolitan areas are located. Um, because the, the electric system operator in Texas preferred uh, remaining at the native voltage, which is 345 kV, it was a challenge to develop a system that delivered the amount of power that they were looking to develop um, efficiently over that distance um, without using a higher voltage. And we've installed not only very uh, large uh, 345 kV lines, um, but also a lot of series compensation uh, to make up for the, the distance challenges. And we've run into some, some, some technical issues with those series capacitors and a phenomenon known as subsynchronous resonance harmonics. Uh, which has created some concern by the generators that there's an interference uh, issue um, whereby that, interfer that harmonic interference may actually damage some of the turbines. Um, so this is a, an issue that <clears throat> we continue to deal with today. Uh, it's not an insurmountable problem, but, uh, but some of these challenges are what drove us to look at our transmission lines, particularly um, over distance where where, where capacity was a problem and where delivery over that distance was a, was a need. And rethink if we needed to design a new transmission line from the ground up at a native voltage, what could we do to, to make that line act like a higher voltage line or perform at a higher level than our conventional designs? At the same time, um, and what you'll, what you'll see in some of the coming slides is the way we achieve that advantage is by uh, creating a, a compacted line design, so moving the phases of each circuit closer together. So that what that does is it changes the geometry of the electrical phases and leverages the physics associated with the, with the uh, power flowing through the line 
to actually increase the power delivery capability and reduce the overall impedance of the line. Uh, as a result of that compaction, however, it's also allowed us to create a structure that is significantly smaller than our conventional designs, uh, much more low profile and uh, sort of streamlined and modern compared to our conventional designs. So we didn't necessarily set out to design a, a different looking transmission line, but as a result of that compaction, we were able to uh, develop what we feel is a, is a unique uh, and, and modern design that accomplishes both the electrical system performance advantages as well as uh, some aesthetic appeal as well. We spent uh, three years approximately in the overall development <clears throat> um, in, in creating a new transmission line, particularly a compact transmission line. There are a lot of um, questions around electrical stresses, around lightning performance, uh, transient performance um, and those kind of issues that we really wanted to make sure that we addressed prior to implementing the technology. Uh, so we worked with uh, the Electric Power Research Institute and our, uh, our structural partner, in this case uh, Valmont, to do a significant number of simulations uh, and then also full-scale uh, prototype testing at, at, the, at the facilities, um, simulating switching performance, lightning performance, uh, corona, audible noise, magnetic field levels, electrical field levels, um, really in, in a sort of a feedback loop, uh, testing and then optimizing the design to come up with what, what we feel is a well-tested and proven design uh, that will perform um, the way we, we designed it. Um, we do have 14 uh, patents, uh, seven have been granted and seven pending. Um, in uh, North America primarily and Europe and some other countries around the world. Um, so, you know, it is certainly a departure from what we're used to seeing with transmission lines, uh, but we're very excited about the, its potential, um, and I'll share a little bit about uh, what that potential is. So a little bit about how it works. <clears throat> this is a, a little bit of a, a technical slide, but it's sort of boiled down into, into the basics. So as I mentioned, what we're doing with the design primarily is leveraging the physics uh, and the geometry of, of the line to increase its performance. The ability of a line to move power over a distance is a function of that distance and something known as the surge impedance loading or SIL factor. Uh, basically, this is how much power you can move across the transmission line while maintaining adequate voltage uh, and reactive power support um, so that essentially you have megawatts coming out the, going in the sending end and coming out the receiving end. Um, and that equation that you kind of see there is related to the voltage as well as the impedance of the line. So if you can't apply a higher voltage, then a way to increase the line's capability is to uh, lower what's called the surge impedance. And that's related to the line's um, inductance and capacitance characteristics. The way you, you can manipulate those characteristics are by changing the distances between the three phases of each circuit on a transmission line, by changing the conductors that are used, both the size of the conductors as well as in a bundled configuration, the spacing between those conductors. And, uh, and so moving those different things around impacts the overall impedance of the line and so we're able to increase the surge impedance loading capability by moving the phases closer together, by utilizing a subconductor bundle with a specific spacing, changing the, the, the diameter or the distance between those individual conductors, and by changing the, the size of the conductor itself. And it was an iterative process to change each of these variables and find and come up with an optimal configuration that not only maximized performance, uh, but also um, didn't create any electrical stresses that couldn't be mitigated. Um, you know, so there is you know, a certain amount of spacing from a, a code standpoint and from an electrical stress standpoint needed to be maintained. And we were able to do that through an iterative process. The, the structure that you see here is, is one of the more unique aspects of this design. Um, it's a single cross arm supporting all three phases on each circuit of a double circuit line. And 
that really was was something that came in after. Once we were able to achieve the performance levels that we wanted, uh, the structure was designed to make sure that the uh, the circuit or each of those uh, phases of the conductor on both circuits were held in those exact positions throughout the line so that you uh, not only structurally have a sound transmission power, but also uh, are, are maintaining the the, uh, the exact geometry necessary to achieve that performance. This, these are some of the statistics um, in a comparison. <clears throat> this is um, the bold design compared with our, our current standard for uh, for transmission line designs today. The most uh, telling features, uh, as you see there, the increased capacity. Um, we're able to achieve between a 40 and 60 percent increase in power carrying capability over a transmission line um, simply by utilizing this design versus a conventional design. As a result of the compaction, you also are we're able to reduce the overall tower height uh, by between 20 and even, even exceeding 30 percent. So our conventional 345 kV towers uh, can reach 150 feet uh, approximately. And on average, we're able to construct a bold 345 kV uh, tower uh, at about 100 feet tall, so about a third shorter, uh, and still maintain all uh, clearances and, and conductor uh, motion issues and, and any sort of structural issues that you might have. Um, as a result of the delta configuration that we showed, the triangular configuration, there's a canceling effect of magnetic fields, and of course, Magnetic field levels can be a concern, a uh, public concern. Um, and so by virtue of the design, not that we set out to do this, but by virtue of the design, magnetic field levels are reduced by approximately 50%. And because we're using a bundled conductor um, configuration, um, of course the energy losses are primarily a function of the resistance of the line, so we're using a lower resistance conductor bundle, which helps reduce energy losses as well. So one of the questions we often get is, what's the cost of, of this particular structure? Um, <clears throat> the There is a slight premium uh, on the 345 kV version, but that's driven by two factors. One, as I mentioned, the bundle of conductors we're using uses three individual uh, conductors per bundle. So that's our typical design only uses two, two conductors per bundle. So that increase in, in wire is a is a, a slight cross premium. It adds some weight to the structures. Uh, but it also is the reason why energy losses go down too. So there's a trade-off there between uh, some extra cost uh, and but some gained efficiency. And when you certainly look at it on a cost per megawatt capacity basis, um, it is a cost savings. And then when you factor in what the energy savings might be associated with it, it can be a significant savings over the lifetime of a, of a transmission line. So depending on what your what your individual needs might be, um, that it can be a, a very cost-effective option for building new transmission lines. Or what we're finding the application being is rebuilding transmission lines in existing right away, where potentially um, higher voltages or, or larger towers may not be feasible. We're able to build higher capacity lines in existing rights of way that perhaps with conventional designs we would not be able to. This, this is a, an illustration of, of that fact. Um, again, uh, with our typical 345 kV lines, we would we would use a 150 right of foot right away width. Um, for, for those, and really what we're showing here is that you're able to get um, essentially the capacity of three individual circuits in a single right-of-way, or another way to look at that is a double circuit tower plus another single circuit tower in the same right-of-way. Um, so we're able to really maximize the use of existing electric corridors um, through this design. And again, at the same voltage, so it's not that, uh, uh, that, that, that we're doing anything other than changing sort of the physics and the geometry of the transmission line. And as you can see, it's actually on a shorter 
structure, uh, so that makes it easier potentially to site and, uh, and route. Here's another uh, visual uh, just showing sort of a comparison of uh, structure heights. Um, a couple things to point out on the structures themselves are you'll notice that the comparison between the, for example, the two towers on the left and the two towers on the right, um, the attachment points of the, the lower phases are a little bit different um, on each one, and that's because the span lengths, um, the optimal span length for the towers might be a little bit different. Um, but the actual difference in tower height is going to be the same. So you're looking at, you know, approximately that uh, on the 345 kV end, about a 50 foot difference, uh, or I guess in this case, 45 foot difference. And then, um, you know, about a 26 foot difference on the 230 kV version. Um, but at the same time, and this is on a 100 mile basis, um, you can see the, the difference in capacity of the of the two different versions of the tower. Um, as you move the line, if the line is shorter, uh, you will get more capability out of the line, but the scaling will be the same. So regardless of how long the line is, uh, you will achieve this this level of improvement in in power carrying capability um, by using the bold design. So just a, just a way to illustrate, you know, it, it packs more punch uh, essentially in the same same area um, in terms of moving more power and, and doing so in a more compact uh, type uh, right away. So this is a, a slide, it's a, it's a little bit more technical, um, but we wanted to show inside a, a typical planning model that we use, a power flow model, how can we demonstrate this difference in performance uh, between the two. So this is a line that we modeled uh, that's actually located in New York State um, it's about a 100 mile, 345 kV line. And what we did is basically just took a conventional design, um, modeled the performance of that line, and then took that out, put the bold parameters into that model, and ran the same analysis on the two. What you see on the, the left hand side is the voltage level in a per unit. So 1.0 is, is really the uh, where you're trying to maintain voltage. And as you increase, megawatts on that line, as you see on the x-axis, um, the voltage begins to degrade, and this is just a common, you know, common for any transmission line. Um, but before you reach the thermal capacity of a line, you may reach a point in this case where um, from a, the, the, the line is absorbing too much reactive power so that you, you, even though there may be thermal capacity remaining, the line physically can't carry any more megawatts without reaching a point of voltage collapse. So the line on the left, you see the red line, at about 950 megawatts, it reaches a point where no more, you can't move any more power on that line without uh, voltage degrading, degrading to a point where the system becomes unstable. What we're showing with the bulb design, which is the blue line, is that the point where that occurs is out past, you know, in the close to the 1,350 megawatt range. So we're demonstrating that simply by using this design, we're able to move 400 more megawatts over this particular line without doing any sort of compensation or any sort of change other than utilizing the design. And what that represents is, you know, approximately 40 to 45 percent increase in power flow capability over that same line versus a conventional design. So this is just a way that in our planning models that we use for all reliability analysis, um, you know, for, for typical power system planning uh, that we can show based on the parameters of this line that, that benefit of, of increased power flow capability. This graphic shows a little bit about the magnetic field levels. Um, the two uh, lines that you, you can see here on the bottom is the bold um, magnetic field levels and usually where you measure that is at the edge of the right-of-way. So we're looking at a couple points in the right-of-way. Um, and you can see that, that this line versus the conventional line at the edge of right-of-way is approximately 50% lower than a conventional line at the same capacity. So magnetic fields are, are a function of how much power flows through the line. And typically, 
you do that measurement at the maximum power flow level. So what we're showing here is that if we were to build a traditional line um, carrying a certain amount of power, if we were to build the same line with bold, the magnetic field levels would be approximately 50% lower at the, those points in the right of way. The flip side of that is that if you wanted to carry 50% more power in that corridor, you can do so and those magnetic field levels would be equal to or lower than what a conventional line design would be, uh, even though it's carrying significantly more power. So in particular, uh, when we're rebuilding in some existing rights of way that perhaps we cannot expand, um, and, and if, if magnetic field levels are either a, uh, if there's rules potentially for limits on magnetic field, or if it's just a general uh, concern by the public, uh, we're able to demonstrate that we can reduce those levels uh, significantly by using this design. And by its nature, it's also a little bit quieter um, you know, transmission lines, particularly when it gets uh, wet or foggy, uh, you can hear sort of a crackling effect. Um, and, and so the bold design uh, is also runs a little quieter, so it's a, it's a little bit more um, appealing, you know, to people that may be living around the line to have a, a little bit quieter transmission line. Uh, this is it's just an example, again, picking on the state of New York, but uh, New York has been progressive in their uh, thinking about uh, siting transmission lines and, and those kind of things. Um, they've actually essentially incentivized uh, utilities to um, rebuild uh, transmission lines in, in existing corridors and try to, in the, in, if you can do so without expanding the right of way, and if you can do so with a structure that is uh, not any taller than uh, the structure that's there, then you, you can achieve an expedited uh, siting uh, and permitting process. So they're essentially incentivizing folks to use designs like this um, that would be, have very little impact from a visual perspective or from a property perspective, but still can achieve the levels of uh, performance advantage uh, at the same time. So we see this as a, as a trend across many of our states um, where they're trying to not necessarily limit new transmission development, uh, but incentivize um, transmission developers to think about how best to utilize right away. So uh, mentioned line losses, and of course line losses are really a function of the type of conductor that you use. Um, but you know, particularly over distances um, and, and at higher voltages like we're talking about, um, there's a significant opportunity for reducing energy losses at the transmission level. Um, I mentioned that our 345 kV design using a three bundle conductor by its, by its nature, because we're using that extra conductor, our line losses are approximately 33% less than what they would with a two bundle conductor. And, you know, that may not be, you know, you may use that three bundle conductor for other reasons, but the cost of those losses can actually offset any cost premium associated with, with utilizing the design. And you know, even just considering a 50 mile line, <clears throat> there's enough energy savings there to power 7,000 homes. And, and I think that's something that maybe hasn't been as appreciated in, on tra in transmission in the past, um, but we're certainly seeing um, more emphasis on energy efficiency. And so some of those loss savings can help offset some of the potentially uh, extra costs associated with new technologies. I, I alluded to this issue uh, a little bit earlier about the series compensation harmonics. And again, we, we, we own many series capacitors and we operate some long transmission lines and, and, um, and really this is a new, new issue that we haven't really dealt so much with in the past. And it's not something again that, that doesn't have its solutions, however, you know, we, we do see that the fact that Bold's configuration um, reduces the impedance and actually acts like a line with series compensation built into it, um, you can avoid some of the potential issues between those series capacitors and, and the, the harmonics uh, issue with uh, not only just not only renewable generators, but even conventional generators as well. 
So as we're building out infrastructure to reach some of these uh, you know, new large-scale renewables, uh, we'll think a lot about these types of issues and, and to the extent these types of technologies can help us avoid um, complications, uh, we think that's a good thing. Uh, this is just a couple photos from our, uh, our first project that we're currently uh, finishing up in Indiana. Uh, we built a 345 kV uh, tower with 345 kV on one side and 138 kV on the other in an existing right-of-way. Uh, so you see in the picture on the left, uh, the towers that were in this right-of-way before are, are similar to those uh, just to the left and right of the tower. And those are double circuit 138 kV structures. So you can see we came into this existing right of way with a higher voltage, higher capacity line uh, at a, basically the same height as the towers that were there conventionally. So um, we were able to reduce the distance. So if we were if we were to build this on new right of way, it would have been significantly longer, uh, significantly more expensive. Uh, but by rebuilding what was a, a a 70-year-old transmission line uh, in its existing corridor with BOLD, we were able to achieve not only uh, essentially a 10x uh, increase in capacity in that corridor, uh, but we were able to do so with very little um, opposition from the public. And one of the main reasons of that is because the tower heights were not, the structures were not significantly larger than what was there before. So it's been a very successful project. Uh, construction has gone very well. Um, and we're happy to say that that project will be complete uh, in the very near future. And as part of our partnership with uh, the Electric Power Research Institute, uh, we also have installed uh, monitoring, both physical monitoring as well as electrical monitoring on this line. So we'll be doing a follow-up to our testing, which is monitoring the real-world real performance of the line um, and, again, gaining information and, and insight into, into how it operates going forward. Again, just a few more uh, photos of the construction process. Um, you know, there is a full family of structures uh, for um, not just the you know, tangent structures and, and straight lines, but as um, you can see in sort of the bottom right-hand corner is a structure for corners, you know, for angled structures. Again, maintaining the delta configuration of, uh, of the line, but, but in a way that allows you to turn a corner. Um, and then dead-end structures are, are a two-pole uh, system again, keeping the delta configuration of the of the three conductors, uh, but allowing you to essentially build this line in the exact same way that you would build any any traditional line. Um, there's really nothing particular about it that would limit um, where and when you could utilize the design. Um, because the the phases are compacted, if you get into spans that are beyond uh, let's say 12 or 1300 feet in length, um, there's some mitigation that may be required in terms of interphase spacers um, at the midpoint. But again, that's a, a fairly easy to implement a mitigation practice. So uh, we were able to build it structure for structure and a replacement uh, in this corridor um, quite well and quite easily. We do have a, a lattice tower version of the design as well. You can see that in the simulation on the left-hand side, <clears throat> and that compared to our traditional design on the right-hand side. Again, you get the exact same performance advantages out of it, uh, the same structure height, um, but in a, in a lattice format. And we are building a couple projects uh, starting this year using this lattice design. And it's, it's not necessarily as aesthetically pleasing, we think, uh, than, uh, than maybe the tubular steel version, um, but it is a little less expensive um, in terms of fabrication. And so uh, since we're rebuilding an existing line, um, actually this is a this simulation is of that exact corridor. Uh, it's in farm fields in western Indiana um, where there's a lot of wind development. Uh, so the lattice tower made a lot of sense here because we were, we were replacing existing lattice towers um, and there wasn't a huge amount of public impact. Uh, so, so we're able to, to sort of adopt the same concept to different types of structures um, and different types of terrains as well. Uh, we do have some projects in Texas, uh, as I mentioned, that you know where wind is, is certainly uh, continues to be developed. 
um, uh, initially uh, some small wind interconnection project, uh, but we're looking at some much longer uh, transmission lines down in Texas, potentially using this design as well. So um, this is a, a an area that is prone to hurricanes, and so uh, we're we're looking at designing the structures to a higher wind speed uh, than we would normally. Uh, but that's not really a, a problem. Again, we can we can design this this tower um, to the same standards that we would any of our conventional towers. So we're hopeful that uh, in places like Texas, which really is sort of the situation where this was born, um, that this list design will be used in, on current and future projects as well. Um, so again, you know, this is um, just sort of to wrap things up um, about, you know how we see bold going forward. Of course, this is a design that, that we developed and we're just now implementing. Um, we're just now beginning to share it um, with other utilities uh, around the world. Um, and it does have uh, different modeling parameters for, for planning studies. Um, structurally, it has some, some unique aspects as well. So, um, so what we would be looking to do is work with interested utilities um, in more detail, um, sharing more about uh, the technical aspects, uh, the, the testing results, and really working one-on-one -on -one with, with utilities to look at applications and, and see if this is a design that might make sense for, uh, for them and, and effectively help them build it. Um, so that's what we're here to do and that's what we're here, we're here to offer as well. Um, but, you know, we think this is an, a very encouraging um, uh, product. Um, and certainly isn't the only solution to every problem that's out there, um, but we do think it's, it represents a, a real leap forward in terms of overhead line design, and we'd like to, to see it implemented in, in places um, certainly outside our footprint and hopefully outside the country at some point as well. So, we're, you know, we are excited about uh, some of these advances, and, you know, we haven't really done a whole lot in terms of advancing uh, and transmission line designs over the past uh, 50 years or so. <clears throat> so uh, this represents a departure for us, but uh, we're certainly encouraged by uh, by the direction uh, and and uh, excited about the potential for it. So with that, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and end the presentation, and we can uh, start into the qu question and answers. <laughs> 